Buenas tardes, buenos Welcome, días. Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Depending on uh, the country you're in, we welcome you. I'm Sandra Reyes of uh, the Star of LACNIC, and we thank you for having come to this uh, webinar. Um, today, we will have Alejandro Guevara, Solution for Architect Nokia, and Alejandro Costa, uh, R&D coordinator in uh, LACNIC. But before, um, let me discuss uh, the dynamics we're going to have. It's going to last uh, about two hours and uh, all along you'll be able to ask questions about the workshop and you can write them down in the Q&A panel that you'll find in uh, the toolbar at the bottom. The speakers, Alejandro Guevara and Alejandro Costa, will explain how it will work and they'll, they may respond to the questions uh, um, while uh, during uh, the talk or at the end, uh, we have, you have three languages. You can choose uh, the uh, language you wish, uh, clicking on the button, the globe map. So uh, the webinar is going to be recorded and in future days, we're going to share it with you. This was all for me. So thank you for your attention. And now I leave you with this workshop, giving the floor to Alejandro Costa. Hello, Sandra. Hello, everyone. Good, good morning. Good afternoon. Well, I'm so happy to be uh, at this webinar. And uh, if I may, I think that people are looking forward to this webinar because really what we bring today, personally, I was uh, very moved to have two BGP, IPv6, uh, DNS, uh, Container Lab, Linux, and everything together the same day, compressed in two hours. Uh, I think it's fascinating. Let me introduce our colleague with the, the colleague with whom I gave the webinar, Mr. Alejandro Guevara from Venezuela. He lives in Canada and I like the way he puts it. Um, he um, uh, was born in Venezuela, but he's a proud Canadian and he's called, uh, they call him Alejo. He has worked uh, 20 years uh, uh, in integrators and service providers, and today he works for Nokia. And he has a vast experience in IT networks, cloud integration, larger uh, webs. Uh, so I I know him personally. And uh, from now on, you are a friend of the House of the Internet here in Uruguay. And myself, I work in LACNIC in R&D, in innovation and development rather. So let me share the presentation. And uh, as Sandra said it, the questions, uh, we have a Q and A uh, session part. So you, you, you are invited to ask any questions and we will be very happy. Alejandro and I to answer. And if we don't have any answers, I always like to commit with you to find the right answer. So if we don't answer right away, it, we can give you a video call or, uh, but give you the answer you deserve. So the agenda today, we're going to start with a theoretical part that is very important because if we understand that theoretical part that we show at the beginning then we'll be able to properly understand the container lab and uh, the hands-on part so those of you who know me may know that we always like uh, the webinar but also to have a hands-on part so we are going to work of yaml IPv6, it's three or four slides per topic, uh, NDP and uh, BGP. And we're going to talk about the uh, num numbering plan uh, by the topology. And uh, Alejandro Guevara will be showing us the topology, a topology that is wonderful. And I think that this topic may help us work better in our networks. So, very brief. The IPv6 header 
as a good course, we must uh, give a brief overview of uh, the IPv6 header. We know that it has a first field that is called a version. Obviously, it's always uh, it has a number six because it's from where I have the um, cursor to here to bit um, bit zero to um, uh, thirty one and. Uh, in IPv6. Let me say that then we have a very important field that is called the traffic class. This is what in the IPv4 world in most books was called DSCP, differentiated service code point. So this is nothing but uh, what you use to handle the quality of service. It is uh, quite normal for uh, network providers to mark in this field the bits in a certain order that their devices will be able to understand and they will be able to give priority on them. For instance, if you have a voice traffic, video traffic, uh, if it's a very important uh, um, uh, client, they put here the class of traffic and once the routers re they receive it, they can use that field to know whether in an expedited traffic and or if it's a complicated traffic, I can send it through the uh, provider with uh, the uh, broadest uh, band, um, uh, the widest uh, band. So in IPv6, we have quality of service with no convenience uh, inconveniences. Then we have a 34-bit uh, field that is called flow label. It's a flow identifier. This didn't exist in, in the IPv4 world. Basically, today, the operators can mark this field. And today, most uh, routing devices can read and mark this. And they also use it to manipulate the traffic and or to do different operations on those package, packages and uh, give them some function. Um, I'm stopping in this field too, because Alejandro Guevara, my colleague, will tell you a bit about a function that he can do about flow identifier. Let me mention another field. Um, we have a very important field that I, and I like to, when, uh, um, with the IPv6 header, because if you remember the IPv4, uh header we had two fields about the size it wasn't just the ipv uh four header because it was all 20 bytes that's the only thing that they they could do but up to 60 bytes and we had another field that during uh, the maths we the maths we had the payload that it carried today in ipv6 we have only one field about the size of the data that is called the payload length and why is that? Because this is marvelous, because the size of the header is fixed. It's 40 bytes. So when uh, they uh, you receive an IPv6 uh, package and you want to know the payload, you just have to look at that. In the past, it was more complicated. Then we have the next header field. Basically, this field makes reference, remember that IPv4, IPv6 are, pro, uh, are three, layer three. Um, in the IPv4 world, this was called the protocol. Now, what is it for? What is this field for? It indicates the network, what IPv4, IPv6 are carrying. That is, if it, uh, we are a layer three protocol that we are carrying uh, layer four, UDP, uh, some kind of ta tunnel, and in the here I can take ICMP, uh, although some uh, uh, literature describes it as a layer, a 3.5 layer, but we are saying when I'm IPv6 and uh, ICMP goes on top of me. Then we have another very important field. I love this field. It's called of limit, and I love um, this uh, Hop, the hop limit is, I love these names because the name really represents its function. In the past, it was called time to lift, uh, time to live, time to live. It was very far from 
reality because the packet doesn't live 750 seconds in the night or five minutes or two seconds. That doesn't work like that. And then the hop limit uh, basically indicates how many hops a packet can, uh, an IP a datagram can uh, travel before reaching destination. For instance, if you put here, let's say 10, that packet instead, uh, before it comes uh, to destination, it may go through 10 uh, layer three devices because that's what happens because each device uh, layer three will reduce by a value of one in this hop limit. What will happen is that the device that has the responsibility of taking this hop limit from one to zero has to send an I and P uh, to origin. And when we do a test route, for instance, it may say time exceeded in transit. Uh, so, and because the device before reaching destination had to mark from one to zero. And then we have the source address, the destination address, 128 bytes. So let me be uh, briefly talk about YAML. This is very important. We can't lose sight of it. First of all, what is YAML? YAML is a language of data serialization. Um, this concept, we got it from YAML.org and this left side from Wikipedia. So but basically, what does this mean? Well, there are many other languages for a data visualization. So this is direct competition, a description of JSON, XML, and we can even use, well, uh, CCV, although the concept of language is too large, but YAML is uh, data serialization um, language, and it's human friendly. It can be read by humans. And let me give you some examples. If now in the test I show a JSON, very probably um, the first time, um, it's going to be difficult to see that uh, JSON or XML because it's rough. It's, it's difficult. In the case of XML, seeing the tags, uh, opening and closing uh, tags in the JSON, the keys, or if it's indented, it will be even worse. And YAML basically came, if we, and as a matter of fact, we're going to do it, what I'm describing now is I'll need it for practice. And now let me show a YAML, almost the first uh, five seconds. Do you'll understand what this is all about other data about YAML. In XML, in C, in Python, and Perl. So YAML is a language inspired in XML, C, Python, and Perl. It was launched in 2001. And YAML today, December 2023, is becoming almost the de facto standard of the language for automating development environments. It's no longer uh, a secret, Docker and others. And today we speak about container labs. And everything is done over YAML. Now, for those of you who don't know what container labs is, and Alejandro Guevara will be telling you more about this. Container labs is an environment where we can simulate or virtualize a large amount of containers with a very, very real network topology. So we'll see more about this later on. So a bit more about YAML. The basis, the, the main basis of all this is that everything is based on the value base. The base is a variable and the value of that variable and everything is indented. Those of us, so the value base is like a Python and then indented all those of us who come from Python 2 or Python 3 are quite familiar with this. And on the right, we have an example. 
these are very straightforward words, name, topology, kinds, image, type. And I won't dwell on this because Alejandro Guevara will explain all this that we have on the right. This was taken from one of the YAMLs of the topology that will be running in a while. Now let's speak about the numbering plan because the topology we'll have a look at. We will have a look at the numbering plan because I'd like to expand on this because this is closer to the reality that we might have in our own networks. So those of you who've gone through a resource request through LACNIC, you are aware that we are asking for a sort of schematic representation of the network and so that you tell us about the numbering plan you have. And this is done for several reasons. We are all aware that we have been involved with the IPv6 deployment for quite some time now, but we want that network deployment to be done following best practices and not lightly in all our courses, we include security. So the IPv6 address plan is like an advantage, should be like an advantage. We have heard about the technical advantage of IPv6 and the number of addresses that you have, and you don't have a checksum in the header, so you don't need to do all the maths. And there is no fragmentation of the transit. So all these are amazing advantages of IPv6 over IPv4, but an additional advantage is the IPv6 address plan. So let us have a quick look at this. At LACNIC, we have organized IPv6 addressing webinars, but now let us focus on this part, on mapping the nibble to a function, to a location. So this is what is in fashion now. Now, what is a nibble? The nibble is a character. Nibble literally means half a byte, so four bits. Here I have a representation of a, an IPv6 address. So each character in the IPv6 world is represented by four bits. This means mapping a nibble to a function. So each one of these should have some form of representation. You might say, well, this field over here, this nibble, which is a zero, can represent a country, a service, a university, a career. The second one could represent a client, a government or private client or the academia, and so on. And even a department within a company. So this last one here, for example, this one over here, letter D, the fourth nibble of field four could represent a department, a section in the university. A could be finances, B can be sales and tech. C is technology, and C can be laboratories, and so on. So this is what I want you to bear in mind when building your IP address plan. For the purpose of today's lab, we did the following. OK, well, here's an example. And the next slide will show the example for today. But over here, we have two nibbles that represent the country. And this is perfectly fine, because with two nibbles, I have one byte. One byte are eight bits to, to the eighth are 255. So it would have to go 256 combinations theoretically, but these are hexadecimal values to the zero and the F, which is two. So the, then the second one, the two last nibbles of this field of the subnet basically refer to the province to the department, to the, to the state. I can combine that with the country. I say that I'm in Canada and maybe in Ontario or in a city. 
or I'm in Canada, in Vancouver, and I can combine these over here. But tomorrow I can be in United States, but in Miami, and then in Colombia, but in the city of Bogota. So I just switch these values over here. Here we have some further examples. Another field can represent a service. For example, collocation, the hosting, host of IP and PPS and so on. And then the type of client, private, public, business, residential. But this is like a scheme. And so this can be more than larger providers or smaller providers, a university that didn't receive a slash 32, but a slash 42. And over here with these examples, and this is for today's topology, we'll be using the prefix 2001 DB8. So you will realize that everything we'll do will be done on this prefix, which is the one on documentation. This prefix is only used for documentation purposes, for examples, for labs. I cannot put it in my network to browse the internet and to access different uh, sites. You cannot do that. <clears throat> it's considered a bogon, and this is Therefore, the reason why it should be filtered, 2001 DB8 colon slash 32. So for today's webinars, what did we do? We have the prefix 2001 DB8, and for the purpose of the example, this topology, we have the country represented with the first nibble country. We have two countries here, Colombia and Venezuela, for this example. The second level is represented as type of client. Today, we use private client and government. So what does this mean? When the first nibble is the letter E, the country will be Colombia. When the first nibble is a letter D, it's Venezuela. If I enter here the letter C, this could be Peru. If we put letter A, it could be Argentina, just to give you an example. If we could put B, it could be Brazil and so on. Now the type of client, once again, we have a private client and government. So the second nibble of the subnet, when we look at the letter A, it is a private client, which is letter B is the government. And then the third nibble for the purpose of our example, if it's zero, it means it's a GPON network. And if it's a letter C, it's a satellite network. So once again, this is what you can use for building your IPv6 network plans. So these things can really be most meaningful. So if I'm using a nibble, I can have 16 different positions. In the case of client, the same. If I use one nibble, if I have two nibbles, I have 256 possible positions. So you have to take that into account. Now let us speak about NDP. We're going to speak about three NDP packets, which are most convenient, and these should be taken into account for today's purposes. What is NDP? So this is a neighbor discovery protocol. This is a protocol that basically are ICMP 6 messages, which will have a scope only within the network where I am, the bus net packet. So this won't be routed in the middle and so on. That is why the hop limit, remember this is a TTL in IPv4, this hop limit will always be 255, which is the maximum value. So let us start with the first. I want to start with a packet called NS neighbor solicitation. This is literally the replacement of the ARP protocol in the IPv4 world. In the IPv4 world, ARP is a mechanism whereby I recognize the destination IP of someone in my network, but ultimately I will deliver the packet using the destination IP address but also the MAC address, the physical address, or the network interface card. So basically, in the PV4 world, we did IRP, we remember broadcast and all the rest. 
but today in the IPv6 world, that ARP mechanism was replaced completely by the neighbor solicitation. Now, very briefly, how does this work? I am host A, I want to know the back address of device B. So I'm going to build a packet where the origin is here and the destination address is a multicast address. So here we start seeing the efficiency because the destination is multicast. This multicast is called SNM. MSN, multicast solicited node, it's 124 fixed bits, and I'm going to do an append to build the SNN. Now, these last 24 bits, and the, in the initial ones are a fixed address, and the last 24 bits correspond to the IPv6 address of destination. So beyond that, we need to say that this has an ICMP v6 packet. This ICMP packet has a limited number of fields. You have the code field and the type field. The type is going to be 135. When a receiver sees I have a packet, an IPv6 packet 135, which is a neighbor solicitation, the information it carries, the payload is the MAC address. So recapping, how will it know the MAC address? It has a packet which is neighbor solicitation with the origin address, a multicast destination address, which belongs to it, which it belongs to, sorry, and it will have the ICMP payload in the MAC address. So it's telling the world, it's telling the network, where there might be many devices, well, hey, this has the IPv6 address, or rather, what is the MAC address for the IPv6X? So the response to a neighbor solicitation is a packet called neighbor advertisement. In this case, both origin and destination are a unicast address. We don't have multicast here. So it's going to say, it's going to answer back, well, yes, the IPv6 address you're looking for, I have it, and the MAC address is this one. So now the type changes, it was 135, but now the type here in ICMPv6 is 136, and the payload is its only MAC address. Now, obviously, it will receive this, and it will know, well, the next time I'm going to send to B, it will contain the B's IPv6 address and at layer two, this MAC address. So this is how the response works to a neighbor solicitation. It's sent, you send a neighbor advertisement. And this is a third packet that I wanted to mention. There are five, basically. In, in our typology, we are going to work with several routers. So, just in case, if we see an RA, basically, what does the RA do? This means router advertisement. They are type 134. Basically, I have a router that will be fre uh, sending frequently. And I say frequently because not all the vendors not all the manufacturers send the RA at the same time. Or every three, min three minutes, every five minutes, there's no time established. So you can leave it by default or you can configure it depending on the, where you are. I may wish to uh, reduce or to increase the value. So basically I have an RA that is sending route advertisement with a multicast address. Well, there and the nodes will receive it, and basically it says origin. It will be a link local. Remember IPv6 uh, link local connection, and the destination will be multicast address. And the data that, that is what does this router advertisement package have? It has options. It has a um, network prefix, um, the lifetime values, the time the RA will last, and some self configuration flags. Okay, so let's see in Q&A, 
Oh, they are telling you where the presentation is recorded, where you find the uh, this, the, the recording of this presentation. Okay, so let's go on. We have, so we already talked about the RAs and their importance. <clears throat> so if you have a question of RA, you know, uh, solicitation, etc., you can ask them. Now let's see the BGP part. I have very few slides too. And let me mention, particularly, we're not, we're not going to talk about uh, what BGP is, but BGP in the IPv6 world, what happens here? Well, we all know that BGP is in version four. It went through versions one, two, three, and four. Today, it's very normal to speak of MP BGP, that is multi-protocol BGP. A bit of, of the story. Um, in uh, the RFC 4760, um, th that document defines extensions for BGP to support multiple, multiple protocols so much so that today we're talking about IPv6, but BGP is capable of uh, sending routing uh, information data. If today you have uh, IPv6 uh, 10, 11, 12, uh, as a matter of fact, many of you that have MPLS, today you can send data from almost any uh, protocol invented. Of course, we are all going to be working in IPv4 and IPv6, but so, and the unique world depends on four, etc. So what happened in this document? Basically, we already says that it supports multi-protocol. What happened then? So some attributes that are called MP reach and MP unreach. It's multi-protocol reach of reachability and multi-protocol unreachable. In NLRI, it's a network layer reachability information. I handling these variables plus everything in TGP as uh, the I mean, information and the SAFI the subsequent address family information, I can have several BGP speakers and tell them, well, I have this IPv6 network, I know this IPv4 network, I no longer know it. I can send a BGP message, an update message, including the network, and I can also tell it, well, you know what, I no longer know it. It's important to know that it's protocol independent. Let me mention the concept of router ID. Basically, what's happening with the concept of a router ID in BGP? If, I, I, if I'm in a network that is IPv6 only, very certainly I will need to specify the router ID. For today's example, we did it. And well, I'll tell you why we did it. And the routers always try to be smart. So most of the times when you, they want to, they wanted to select the, the router ID, they have an internal algorithm and it, almost all of them work the way I'm going to say. In general terms, what the router will do, look for the physical interfaces and their logic interfaces, such as uh, the magnifier. If you don't have, uh, as, as the look, look back and if it, it don't have it it will find it in the physics um uh, interfaces if it has in uh interface loopbacks it will use the ipv4 address or the router id that may have the address of their loopback interfaces if there are several loopback or logic interfaces in the uh, machine it will try to use the ipv4 address with the highest IPv4 address uh, obtained in its logic interfaces. In general terms, it is recommended for the router ID to be specified. So we can't let that intelligence to the, the T, to the machine. Uh, selecting the router ID based on the, the logic faces, it, it interfaces, it's not, it does not make sense. Because if tomorrow I change the IPv4 uh, address the VLAN from round one router to the other, and the router had taken that router ID, we're going to have very strong flapping. The BGP session will crash, probably 
that it will have to be lifted, but it will have a downtime, downtime in my network. Uh, if we don't have IPv4 addresses in my router, I will have to identify the router ID. However, I think um, we are going to work in our topology. We are going to have, a, um, and we are going to have a, the uh, to Nokia routers or Linux, and Alejandro will mention it. So what happens with that router ID? In the BGP world, and I won't talk about it, there are four types of messages, open, update, notification, and keep alive. The, uh, they are the only four messages in the BGP world. In the open message, there's a 32 um, a bit uh, files where you put the router ID. In many routers, if they are IPv6 only, they won't be able to generate the router ID and the BGP session will never raise. The value of a uh, of router ID uh, is 32 bits and it is recommended to configure it manually. For today, the topology that we're going to show twice, and Alejandro will show it too, very briefly, um, it's uh, uh, very, you see here, it's a 2001 DB832. This is a, 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 a re backbone that is a Linux, and we have a web or DNS server. This is a Linux that has nine, nine and Apache 2. We have three routers to your left, R1, FRR, OpenBGP, uh, D, and uh, SR Linux. And here in each of one, we have a client connected. Basically, the clients have static routes to um, uh, client one has uh, the forget uh, gateway um, number one, number two, and Alejandro will show us one. So first it says that it's a private a client from Colombia, then the other two are government and private clients from Venezuela. So the IP routing plan matches that. We are speaking of BGP in each of them, and the objective is to do them multi-vendor, not just using this here. All of this is available in GitHub. You'll see it right now, any of you, with Docker installed, you install Container Lab, and you can do a pull with this typology, and you execute Container Lab, and you have it. And almost uh, completing my talk, obviously, here we put each has uh, the router ID. Remember that this is router one, router two, router three. So the router ID here is uh, 10, 101, 10, uh, 201, 10, This one is 10, 0, 0, 1. And this is in autonomous system 6501. This 02 and 03. And the backbone is only in 65,000. Let me see if there are any questions here. There are two questions before I give you the floor. Nelson Cruz asks, what software should we use um, for the IPv6 addressing plan. There are many. Some of them are free of charge, others you have to pay. What I'm going to do to respond to this question, Nelson, I'm going to take two or three softwares and I'm going to put them in the chat uh, while Alejandro Guevara gives his presentation. I already have it under the radar. That is using for the IPv6 uh, addressing plan. And um, in the peer and IPcom systems is a question. In the peer of BGP IPv6, the best option of format between bits or bytes in router microtik. Well, I know microtik. I'm not an expert, but uh, I've used it. Uh, it's it's used in BGP in router v6. I don't know whether that's your question. IP consistemas between bits and bytes, the story changes. Other than the vendor, what I'm interested here is in understanding the concept. So Alejandro, please mention this when you show your part. For instance, when creating the neighbors, 
there are several things that are always mandatory. Then there are several things that are optional and often are important. Alejandro Guevara, we talk about the communities. I'm going to request uh, to you to use the that as a label for it. Each. So basically, the mandatory data when you want to create a BGP neighbor and with router IPv6, you can I can use my source address IPv6, um, the uh, IPv6 address of uh, destination and my autonomous system local and remote. And with that, the BGP session should uh, work. And then I should put uh, filters, especially for the BGP world today. There's a tendency that they uh, we are being allowed uh, that they don't publish anything until uh, policy, um, uh, the exterior bo uh, border protocol is published. So now speaking of trying to respond to your question and to give you a final answer in the BGP IPv6 uh, in bits or bytes, I would do it in nibbles hexadecimal. <clears throat> That's uh, the most uh, recommendable thing to do. And now, Alejandro. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, if appropriate, to all of you in this webinar. Thank you to Alejandro for your introduction. And here I come to talk to the uh, hands thing. Uh, so um, everything that Alejandro said is very important to know what you have to do at the lab. Basically, the tools that we're going to use to implement uh, this lab, I don't know, with Container Lab, I don't know whether you know the tool. I gave uh, a seminar in Lacnog and Antenna Lab and at the Lacnog meeting in Fortaleza about a couple of months ago. But for those of you who are not familiar with the, the tool, this Container Lab was an initiative of a group of engineers to have, uh, of GitHub, to have a network for virtualization of the networks. Uh, Laboratories that would be light, portable, easy to automate, and the most important thing is for it to be multi vendor. And the fact that it came from us doesn't mean that it's not open to the rest of the vendors and the rest of the community. It's very easy to use. I'm going to guide you step by step, either with this typology or others. As a matter of fact, this image that you see here is taken from. Mm, uh, the container that enables me to visualize the graphic through the web, a uh, temporal web face that creates, and I can see the connections. In this case, the lab that we are creating is called IPv6 WS, a uh, web workshop, or in this case, webinar. And there I leave you as a reference some links if you want to see this further the container lab, the uh, OS of uh, 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 SR Linux. And as was pointed out by Alejandro, this typology, if you install a container lab, as a matter of fact, the only thing that you need is to have Docker installed. Windows OSL. So this can be in Windows or in any Linux platform. And for the purpose of this demo, we have two labs. It's always good to have what you're preparing and then uh, something in the oven already cooking. So we have one in my server that is running. So it's multi-platform. And the container lab and the code is exactly the same, regardless of what platform you're using. In this link that we have down here of GitHub, you can download a clone of this repository, and it contains all the necessary files for this topology 
you can then do uh, what you can destroy it you can do whatever you wish now regarding container labs and going back to the topic of why and thanks alejandro for your introduction why I use YAML. YAML is a language that allows us in a user-friendly way to establish or declare our intention when generating a network topology. This is something that IT people have been using for quite some time now. There are tools available already that allow you to use this YAML infrastructure where I define what I need for my services infrastructure with the storage, with a memory, and so on that I need. So this tool uses this YAML and turns it into what we need in terms of infrastructure. In Container Labs, we did the same thing. We took this format which is YAML based. We will see later on for the details. And so Container Labs interprets this YAML and this methodology, which is like a declarative methodology, which establishes how I wish to build my topology. So it then creates the lab, interpreting the files. In order to install container labs, well, this is very simple. It's straightforward. With this command here, the bash, this bash command is smart and shows you, knows which Linux platform you're using or Windows. And then you have the corresponding container labs packets. You don't need to have a very big server with a 16 giga RAM laptop, you can just deploy, deploy quite a complex topology if you, if you wish. So for those of you who wish to follow this lab live, I invite you, if you already have installed Docker, you can install container labs with this command over here. And then you can go to Container Labs documentation and then install it and then clone this with all the repositories contained online, available online. So for the purpose of the topology, let us go step by step. And let's look at the extension of the files. And prior to executing the lab, let's see how it was set up. And then we go directly to see how this lab works. So I think these were all the slides. Oh, yes, these are some of the references. And now let's look at the practical example. So I'm going to share my screen now. As you can see over here, this is like doing magic. That's nothing hidden in the hat. I use a command to show you what is running in Container Lab. This is my personal server. We haven't installed anything at this moment. There's no container deployed here. So this is a clean scenario. So before deploying the laboratory, let us check the topology files. As an editor, I like to check this here. When you clone the repository, let me show you, let me show you over here. So this is the repository available in GitHub. You come to the code part, you copy it, you do a git clone 
already did this. And once you have done this, all the file infrastructure for this laboratory will then be available in your laptop or in your server, or you can even develop it in your ABM. So this is one of the laboratories we're using for this lab, which is being run on DigitalOcean, which is a cloud-based option. So over here, in the documentation, you have the different commands to access the nodes, then the SRL nodes, the FRR nodes. This is all publicly available information. And this, all the different vendors, if they, you have free range routing or if you have other options. So once I have cloned the repo, I'm going to create a file. This file is the IP6 workshop. So you will see that the file structure over here is exactly the same as the one we have over here. You have the readme file containing all the documentation, which you are viewing at this moment, and, and the YAML file. So this is where you have the declarations to build our lab. So we can see this over here directly in GitHub. Maybe you can't see it very well. It's very small. So I'm going to go to Visual Studio so you can view it better. So step by step, starting with the top hierarchy, the first thing we need is to give a name to the laboratory. This name is solely for the purpose of identifying it and distinguishing from other platforms that you might have running on your server. So this is an important functionality of container labs. Of course, if you have sufficient memory and CPU, you can then run more than one lab at the same time. I sometimes work with different projects at the same time, and I have several labs working at the same time. And this is private, provides a lot of flexibility. Then we have the topology. When I have the topology, what I need to define are several things. First, the kinds. And because this is a multi-vendor environment, we can have several kinds of devices running on the lab. Here, for this specific example, I have two kinds, which are the main ones. One which is the SRL Linux image, which are two routers of a topology are based on this technology, specifically an IXR D2L, which is a specific device of the Nokia portfolio. And the other one is the open protocol, kind like free range routing and open GPD, which are Linux Spain. So this is a Linux version. In this case, it's using this image over here, but not necessarily the same option, same variant. And we'll see this later on because container labs also works hierarchically. So whatever I declare as a higher hierarchy, if I don't specify this, it takes what it has it. So it's very clean and organized regarding the deployment or the declaration of the topology. So for this specific case, we're using this image of SRL Linux and a multi-tool multi -tool Linux image, which will then change for more specific language. After I declare the kind, I'm still under topology here. Then we have the nodes. Here in the nodes, if we look at the topology, let me check over here. Here we have the topology. I have the router backbone, which is Nokia, and the R3, which is Nokia, R1 is FRR, and R2 is OpenBGP. So 
This is another important functionality of Container Labs. It not only allows you to create the network elements, but also the clients, the customers. And then there are many other options that could then be discussed in a further webinar. So there are many other options, but of course, as I said, this is for topic for a future webinar. So let's go back to this topology. We're going to start declaring our routers, which is the core of our lab. So we have the backbone over here. So we have the router backbone of here. The type, the kind here, it's a Linux. It already knows which type it is. And this is enough to declare the router. Now, however, Container Labs has further functionalities and advantages. If I already have a configuration for that router, and I want to begin to start with a specific configuration, so I don't need to configure it, I can tell it where that is located. So this artifact over here will simply go to this section over here. It looks up the config file. All this is cloned when you, do, when you start. And then we have a file called router backbone JSON because the configurations of Nokia are based on JSON. So over here, we have a file called router backbone.json where we have the entire configuration. It can be a partial configuration or it could be a full configuration. So it is flexible and you can do the two. So we go back to the YAML file. So let's start with the configuration. So it's a Linux type router for router one. And as you see over here, I'm overwriting the image. Well, not overwriting, but I'm specifying, saying, well, it's Linux, but you know, the image I created generically in the initial hierarchy will not be the one I'm going to use, but you're going to use this one over here. So this is a Linux image, which is also available uh, as a free image. And this is a specific image for free range routing. Another important point is that if the Docker image required by Container Labs to pick up this lab is not available locally in the server or in the laptop or wherever you're running it, quite obviously it will do the pool in the internet for that image if it is available at all in the internet. Now, for the purpose of this specific lab, all the images and all the artifacts for this lab are all available in the internet, so you need no kind of license whatsoever. So you can just practice this in your computer as if you wish. Now, there's another important functionality of Container Lab, which is that we can do bind. Bind is the following. If we have a file in our laptop, a container is something that is quite volatile. So we can create them, we can destroy them as required. So the, uh, you create the ABM and the ABM inside, and uh, you put it nice, and you put the files, and you install packets. No, this is something that uh, you deliver, you use it, and if you don't use it, you destroy it because. With that dynamic, we also need sometimes uh, to go from uh, with that. That's why we, we use, we need to be more dynamic and we use the bytes. So I say, well, I need a configuration. Usually it's in this route. Uh, it, it's in, uh, uh, so you may say, well, I can say uh, map this file that is um, 
inside the container. And as you see, the file is in my configurations folder. It's called R1 FRRR conf. So this is the configuration of the router that is based on free range route. So it, as you see it here. But then afterwards, we're going to see more details. I don't want to lose so much time in the configuration. I'd like to finish with the structure. So in addition to the binds, there's another function, a, a, a feature of Container Lab is that when it starts, I can tell it to execute a command or a, or a series of commands, for instance, uh, to raise a, um, uh, to enable a protocol here, as we are working with uh, Linux images, we know that a, a, a Linux uh, server is not a router by default. It doesn't forward the packet. So uh, I say, well, I'm enabling you for the forwarding packets, in this case of IPv6, so I can execute um, instructions when uh, and that are relevant for the operations of our lab. Let's go on with a router two, that is also Linux, but the image is different. In this case, it's an image that comes from the same, uh, but in this case is an open BGPD. Uh, uh, and now when I'm using images, either from Linux or uh, Explorer, OpenBGP, BGPD. Here I show you the version. This is a recommendation that I give you because you never know when a new version changes the syntax. So you always want your lab to work. So make reference to the version that you're using and you already know that that lab works. Although a new version of open uh, BGPD uh, or open lab or uh, uh, use it first and then and check that it works. I, I, I never like to use the latest one because I don't never know whether it kept the syntaxes of the previous one. So I have you have to test it. So here we are binding to the BGPD configuration. I have it here in my configuration folder. Here you have R2 open BGPD, where you have a configuration for the specific router. And finally, the last router in the topology is, this is in Linux and uh, Nokia, and in this case, is a it's in router three JSON. It's in the configurations binder folder. I have a break. Okay. I, I was going to make a comment about container lab and what this represents for LACNIC. What happens? At LACNIC, as you know, we give courses very frequently on IPv6, BGP, some other technologies, DNS, DNSSEC. And I must admit that we have a lot of time. We have the need of having a lab that is simple to put together, easy and even recyclable. And Container Lab apparently is the solution to our situation. You can go on, Alejandro. Well, sorry for the pause. I'm not at home. I'm in a public place and I was interrupted. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. So finally, this uh, the startup. Uh, the configuration, the R3 JSON, uh, and the configuration here is in my configurations folder. So we finished with the routing part. And here we built 
all the routing thing. But there are no clients in the servers. That's an important part of this lab. So what would you use a network for if you're not connecting any elements? Here we have three clients connected with a typology to each router. They Here they are called H1, 2, and 3, but they could be C1, C2, C3. That's irrelevant. And basically, these are Linux machines cut that are running based on container lab. The first, we are also doing a bind. And this was an idea here. Alejandro won the batch of con advanced con in uh, Linux, he, he said that instead of doing this manually for all clients, why didn't we do a bind from an external file and it is repeated for all clients? Good idea. My name said. So we have uh, here, uh, this is telling the, uh, the client that they have the DNS. Here we have resolve.com. I say that I'm in the domain Nokia Laknica dot twenty twenty three and who's the name server? Here this is the server and the other side that is connected through all these structures. So we'll go back to YAML. We execute a number of uh, commands because we want to make sure that the default uh, comes out through the IPv6 network and not uh, through manage. That is what so we avoid the validation that the clients may go through the IPv6 network that we are creating with Container Lab. And obviously, we are assigning an IP address to the container based on the LAN network that is announced by the container. For instance, we have the CA um, uh, 1 and 2. And the, here, the IP address changes, but they are all mapped through the same resolve.com because they are going to use the same DNS and they're going to be part of the same domain. Notice that the IP addresses coincide. You here you see B01 and A01. There are not too many details here. Ready. And then we'll define our server. Uh, do you have any comments? Yes. No, but finish server. And when we finish this, we have several questions and I want to put them together. Excellent. So let's finish with this because then we have the part of the links. But it doesn't take much time. Yes, I see that the questions are getting here. That's a good symptom. If there are questions, it's because the people are paying attention. So the server. It's Linux. Here you have the binds because it's a, a, a root server. First, we create a file. And this is an interesting thing because here you see that you that I have several execs with several commands that you can put together the commands in a script and run it with a script. But we wanted to show you the versatility that we do it command by command. But if it's more than 10 commands, uh, um, do a script, you map it, and you put it as a bind, and you execute this when you start the machine, as we did with the server. We didn't map it with a, an SH server. Basically, it downloads the image from Apache, the Vine, and it starts the Apache and Vine services to have a DNS uh, through uh, web services. So, and we have other configurations, such uh, as assigning the IPv6 address. In this case, it matches this one. As you can see here, it declares the gateway to the router here and executes the uh, script, uh, of course, Notice that these are Linux commands that can be put here. They are within your container, no problem. And then we execute a command to start, and correct me, Alejandro, if I'm wrong, to start the name 
uh, service or the DNS for the server. And finally, last but not least, and then we'll check the questions. There are already several. Of course, I created the nodes, but they are not connected yet. So I have to wire it to put the cables. So basically, there's a section that is called links. And what I do is to define of the router backbone interface uh, one, one, and you go to router one, interface ethernet one. I from the router R backbone uh, two and be careful because these links are created only in one direction and but the server is uh, smart and uh, sees that and also the R backbone is uh, connected through the interface to the server so depending on the type of router these technologies will be different at the level of the nomenclature of the port but all that is contained there so and finally the connection against router one is connected again with the client one router two client two and router three client three so now um that is how we define this so now we'll go to the questions so uh, well here i have several questions let first me uh, start with two in the chat uh, but please don't ask the questions in the chat, but in the Q&A. In the chat, I may miss them. Mr. Carlos Deidan asks, if you have lab, uh, with, do you have a graphic uh, interface? No, not a, a graphic interface, but there's a command that's called container lab graph, and automatically it creates a web server uh, well, and just by putting HTTP connection to a local host or to a server, 580, and it shows the topology graphically. A graphic interface for interaction we don't have for the time being. They are developing, but if you have the, the tool open, you have a very large community where you can participate and make your contributions, but not now. And finally, the reason why we don't have a graphic interface is because we we saw more of uh, the automation that we wanted the tool to be open enough to make it automatic. But it doesn't mean that in the future we won't be able to use it to interact. But we do have a visualization um, a function, but feature, but not interaction. Mr. Jan Leonardo Estrada Roque ask the concept of binds is similar to volumes yes it's similar volumes maps a complete disk the bind only shows you a route in the disk i can do a bind so a specific as a file as i'm doing here or a complete directory if i want a number of files to be here i do bind to the complete folder here i'm doing it quite specific and i'm doing um a bind more for a file as such yes okay este, Q &A. Well, in de... the q a they're asking for the github address and someone asking why don't you use the ros version for some of the routers? Well, I really wouldn't know, Alejandro. That is the question. The ROS, I don't know. Alejandro Herrera, could you be more specific? Well, if it's from Nokia, this one in Linux was conceived to work in containers, but ROS, which is also in ours from Nokia, in the future will be container based for next year. This is, has been foreseen, but so far we don't have a containerized option. 
there is a parallel project where you can take those images and put them in the container. But these are larger, and I wanted to make this container more um, user friendly. And you can change the images with those from another vendor. He has now confirmed that this router OS of Microtech. Why cannot you? Another Alejandro Herrera is asking. We could have used it. Now we should see if Docker for Microtech also exists. Well, yes. Very rapidly, I was speaking last week with some people at an event, and someone came up who was interested in this upshare from Microtech. And we're about to open a channel or an option in Container Labs channel in Spanish, and the idea I see there are quite a number of people in this webinar, which shows there is interest in the community. But the idea, as I was saying, is to increase the number of images that we can support in Container Labs. So this had to do with the microtech images. Now, Alejandro, we could have used it. This is to answer your question. At LACNIC, let me tell you, that we have organized several webinars already, at least two with Microtix. And the podcast, the LACNIC podcast, if you look this up in Google, LACNIC podcast, we also have quite a lot of things on Microtix. We had one with great feedback on migration. So maybe you can look this up. They're, they're cool. We are asking if the images can be downloaded free of charge. Yes, totally. They're totally downloadable at no cost. And a co question similar to the previous question. Jan Leonardo Estrada is asking, why cannot use volumes? No, why cannot use volumes instead of binds? Or is it the same thing for the purpose of the topology? I wanted this to be lighter. That's why. So I won't take up much more time. So please go on. So once we did this over here, we have the file. Because I'm in Ubuntu, I have to put sudo here. And the command here is container labs, clab. I'm going to write deploy, dp, minus t, which is topology, and I put the topology file that I want to deploy. So once container lab is running, I have this command over here. And automatically, then, it starts running the topology. It creates this manager network in IPv4 and in IPv6. Container Labs is IPv6 ready. And basically, it creates our topology over here. And it downloads it. it. It downloads what is necessary. It creates all the links between the containers and executes all the commands and does all the binds that are required. So it is ready. Container Labs created this topology within a couple of seconds. So this is a summary of all the containers and which is the IPv4 address and more importantly, in IPv6. Container Labs automatically in the PC host file where you're running Container Labs creates an entry both in IPv4 and IPv6. With the name for the name of that container and the IPv6 address. 
and even better, Container Labs also makes this by default, IPv6 by default. So I do ping over here to the backbone router. You see that the response is from the IPv6 address, from the backbone address. If it doesn't get the IPv6 address, it gets the IPv4 address. But by default, it gets the IPv6 address. So it's now ready. So I'm going to start with the node I have my expertise with, which is a Nokia one. And to access the node, I enter SSCH. So this is the by default one, which is admin. And I enter the name of that container. So this number over here, I drew my SSH and automatically I enter here. I enter the password over here. And automatically, I'm in the CL lab of the router. And as I was telling you, this router is pre-configured. All the router we had in the device has now been configured here. In the case of BGP, so based on the topology, this guy over here will have three neighbors, one here, one here, and one over here. I'm going to first check the interfaces. So we go back to the router. We put show network instance default. And I enter interface. And automatically, I get all the interfaces here. They're all in IPv6. There are none are in IPv4. And here you have the interfaces in 1.1, which is for router 1. This is FFAA, which is this one over here, this link over here. Then you have the interface for 1.2, which is in this IP address over here, FFAB over here, AB over here. And finally, this other interface, which is with router number three, which is FFAC. Then, of course, we have the LAN interface, which is the one that is next to the TNS device or the server over here, the, or the web. What is the next step? First, to see the status of my network. I enter show network instance default protocols, BGP, and I can write here neighbor. And then it shows as if by magic, and here you have all the information for router one, one, for router two, and router three. These are the sessions it was established four minutes ago. And in this case, the address family that I'm using for the specific neighbor, which is IPv6 unicast. I'm not using IPv4. And it shows me a summary of how many prefixes I received, how many prefixes are active, and how many prefixes I'm sending to that specific neighbor. And to show you in BGP how this works, BGP, oh, I was forgetting something. So I go back to the lab here, 6501, 002, and 003. And with BGP, which is an external protocol, that you're using in this case, they have to be very careful with what you're sending. They can send you a lot of trash because this is not, un not under your control. So if there is no import policy in the BGP protocol, we don't install this. We can say, yes, thank you for showing me that route, but I'm not going to use that route unless I validate that route. And this validation is based on the agreement I have with my peer. And I say, well, if you're going to send me a route, show me the community and the policy. 
and how can I reach an agreement with a neighbor stating, for example, I'm going to accept these routes. But if you send me something else, I won't accept that other route. So I'm not going to send packets to that network unless we have an agreement. So these are agreements that you do at peering level when you are having activity with an entity. So this is something that I that we do in order to be sure the, of the origin of a route, and we really have to be uh, protected. So in the case of BGP, then here, I put network instance default protocols BGP, and I put info, and here we have the configuration. This is the autonomous system, 65,000 defined in the topology. The router ID, before you ask, you have it in IP4, but this is just a label over here. And in that case, we can use routers in IPv6 and we can do the conversion. But this is a multi-vendor policy. So we don't want to do it as standard as possible. This is why we use the standard router ID in IPv4. And over here, I define the address family that I wish to exchange with the neighbor. This is with Unicast. And I create a group. I create this because I might wish to establish attributes, common attributes for certain groups of neighbors in this case. For all these devices, I'm going to apply the same import policy and export policy. And over here, this is the address family that I'm defining over here. Because you might have a group for IPv4, one group for IPv6, or for eVPN, or even for a different type of signaling. And then we have the most interesting part over here, which here I can say I have three neighbors. This is one over here. FFAA, we go back over here. Then the other one over here, which is the next one, FFAB. And the other one is FFAC, all belong to the same group. I'm going to be exporting and importing the same route. But the one that is specific for each is the autonomous system I'm using to speak. So the other thing that is important to see here is that of the policies. Where can I see the policies? I go to routing policy, info, and here you have the information. First, I'm creating a prefix. This prefix is called service. It's just any name. You can name it whatever you wish. And here, we have the LAN network to which is connected and the web server that I, is what I wish to announce to all the other neighbors. And this is because I want to be sure that I'm not just announcing trash to my clients. I'm just announcing what they want me to announce. So any change in prefix, this could be a whitelist, could be a blacklist. I might say I want to announce all this except for this. So that would be a whitelist. And I'm creating a community. Community are the tags you add to a BGP route. Uh, these communities that I'm using, one for IFO and one for satellite, if we go back to the topology, these are the different clients. I have a DSL, a GitHub, a GitHub and a satellite, and the identity, usually two points of the autonomous system. Uh, semicolon and uh, but you can do any as uh, that you want and then i have my policies as such among the importer policy the first thing that i do is to establish what is my default action what will i do if if you don't comply i'll reject uh, so default action reject i will only accept you if you 
comply with meet all of these conditions. What are the conditions? First condition that you come from BGP, that I'm learning from BGP, and that you sent me the route with the community set DSL. If the machine in the other side, routers one, two, or three of the clients uh, don't change this, I won't accept it. And of course, if they do, uh, if, if they match the statement, then I will accept it. And then G this for GPON and this the same for satellite. So if the routes don't come like this, I won't accept them. Let me put you an example. In this case, the machine, the router that is sending me to routers, it says show network instance default protocols, BGP, neighbors. See, this, this guy is sending me two and I'm accepting one. They are very easy to identify. I do instant default, instance default protocols, BGP routes. So he's going to show me all the routes coming from all the neighbors. In this case, they are IPv6. Summary. There. See that there you have all uh, the routes sent by the neighbors. Notice that in this case, the neighbor in router one is sending me this route twice. Sorry, this route um, here, this I would accept it. This symbol here, the asterisk means that it's valid. And the EU means that it's used. It's being used, it's active. So the three routes that are valid, that are used, are these three. And why didn't it take this one? For two reasons. The first, is that obviously if I see this route, I put prefix, this specific route, and I say detail, when when I see the community that it's generating, when the route arrives, this is not acceptable, but the problem is that this community doesn't match with what with this the problem is that as this route you have in the is path myself as a, a source i can create a routing loop in this case so i don't want to establish a route that i am generating myself alejandro i don't know whether you want to make any comments about this no no not much to add just what you said for the people. Well, what does BGP do? It has a mechanism for the prevention of loops. So the mechanism basically says the following. If I, in the SPAF, uh, if I see my own autonomous system, I won't uh, enable that uh, route. It's to prevent loops. And that mechanism, all the vendors activated by default. And there are some situations when you can disable it, but they're not uh, the kind of thing for this webinar, but you explained it very well. So this is interesting. Managing communities is something that is absolutely necessary for a good traffic engineering in the BGP world so that the people may know that this exists and the Linux server supports it very well. Good. As a matter of fact, if you want to see another command for to check the routes, here I'm seeing the routers of this specific neighbor. Here I'm receiving two routes, as you see here. And here you see, obviously, the AS path. That is why I, I see myself, so I'm rejecting this route. So this route doesn't come from the community because it's not being assigned it. It's not being assigned. So if you want to see images for the configuration of the other, I invite you to see it in GitHub. But here we can see it briefly. Let me get into router two for router two, because I also want to show other routers. Before you enter the other two routers, let's take two questions in the Q&A. 
Yes, the two of them are of a friend of ours, Henry Godoy. Oh, hi, Henry. Yes, we know each other. In the first one, he asks, what other operation system can be emulated, like a Docker that can be in a container lab? Now available, we have Nokia, of course, starting by home. We have Linux, all the var variations, SROS. The, we have uh, our own processor that is before V5. And by other vendors, Cumulus, Arista, Juniper, Cisco. I think there's a project there to add my critic. The I don't have the specific versions, but if you go to our website, Container Lab, and you see kinds, here you have all the versions available now by ben vendor. Here you have Nokia, Arista, COS, VOS, Juniper, Cisco, Comolos, Aruba, Sonic, as a matter of fact, there's a very interesting presentation of Sonic in the forum last week where they used Container Lab as a tool. That was precisely a presentation before my own. I liked it. And then other things like as Linux Bridge, etc., etc., and other type of containers in Linux. And the list grows and grows. Perfect, excellent. Yes. You can also add that you may have a Linux flavor, and then we can install, for instance, a BIOS. And in Docker, you have any sort of things. And another question, Alejandro, before you go on. They are asking for Mr. Henry. Certainly, he, he won an IPv6 challenge in Milaknik. He asks whether there are any configurations to disable the IPv4 address 172 by default, or are they still necessary? When when it starts, it creates this uh, read management, but you can force in the YAML uh, file. As a matter of fact, I have another lab that I'm going to share with the audience of a, a typology that I, a multi-level uh, data center fabric where I showed the IPv uh, 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 management addresses. And I, you can say, I don't want them in a IPv4, or you can design it statically, not necessarily automated. Yes, excellent. And there's a last question, and we'll stop because we only have 20 minutes. It says, Jose Ramirez says whether you can execute the command to visualize the lab graphically. Yes, if you give me a second, I'll show it. As a matter of fact, I think it's easier to do it in the lab, in the cloud. Oh, no, I think I can do it. Yes, I can do it. Now I'm in router one in FRR. I'm not too, too an expert in these commands, but I think that it's IP route or IPv6 route, rather. This is to show you that uh, the BGP, they are learning the routes. You can see in this case by BGP, I'm learning. Um, RIPF through BGP. And we can do the same in router three through CCH. Let's leave this SSH admin lab router three. Ready. Here I can do network instance default, route table, IPv6 unicast. Ready. Here in this case, 
I'm learning the network by BGP, by BGP, and it comes out through the interface one one. That's the one that I have connected to the server. Let me show you the four. Here it says instance default protocol. Uh, BGP. Here it's much easier to configure because I will have only one neighbor that is uh, behind. I have an import and an export policy. Routing policy. Here I have to create the machine for the connection of the satellites, the satellite community, and I create a list of what I want to announce. And I said, well, for this machine, for this case of the protocol, if it's not local, you're going to use a prefix that is called uh, customers. It's going to be a match. Uh, if we have another network that it's not this one, you won't announce it. And as an action to see whether I accept it, not only do I accept it, but in BGP, you will add the satellite community and this, the community. Uh, as it has this community added to the route, I accept it. Ready. We, it's okay. And finally, of course, here I showed you the table of the router. But it's important to know whether this works. How do we know if it works? Let's see here. Here's the commands. I always do this trick to know the names. In this case, I'm going to do a, a docker, sudo docker exec it, the name of the container. In this case, I'm going to put the client one and I'll enter in CA bash. Here I have in client Linux. Remember that we did the bind, but the bind was going to rep, repli replicate uh, it in the file here, you see that the name uh, of file was uh, mapped with the container and I have it here inside. So it tells me like it's the name server and the other side of the network. But the most important thing here is I can reach the name server. So the network is working. Yes, here. I was sweating, but I know no longer. So everything is working perfectly. You see that we have communication with the name server. It's in another lab. It's working. Okay. But the most important thing, I can pin the server because that name server is giving names. This is the domain. So uh, put uh, pin six. This command, I don't know why it took a little longer, but while you do resolution, it takes more time. I think that the command as such, I think there is a function missing, but you see that it's responding with a name. Our DNS server is working perfectly and we are having communication with it and it's responding. Everything is fine. And finally, of course, this is a server of DNS. We have IP. Um, so here, obviously, I don't have a graphic interface to do a browser, but I have a wget to check yes i was forgetting about that yes it's in https so basically this we, we simulated the web server on the other side of the web i have a query and automatically it downloaded did the HTML file, which I now have over here in my So this 
check the connectivity and all the rest in IPv6. And this is the end of my demo, which I hope you liked. I haven't forgotten the question, but this is just to close the demo as such. I hope you liked it and that you can then replicate the lab. The lab is available and we're at your disposal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alejandro. And while you look up the answer for that question, asked by Jose Ramirez, I'm not sure whether he's from Venezuela, from Maracaibo too. So it's a pleasure to have him here with us. Uh, questions are welcome. Someone's asking, how do I stop the lab? Are we going to do that too. So asked by C. Gutierrez. So while you solve that, I would like to do something that is very important, which is to invite all those people who wish to the next technic, LACNIC's technical forum, which will be during LACNIC 41 in Panama from May 6 to 10. And right now we are receiving proposals. So if you have a paper that you think would be interesting to share in container, labs, DNS, IPv6, or VGP, or just anything, issues related to security. Container Labs is great, too, to create testing environments for security purposes. So there are many, many topics. And it's as easy as to look up FTL, LACNIX Technical Forum. You can look this up in Google. And you can submit your proposals. Of course, there is a committee which revises all these proposals, which are then submitted to voting. And if everything turns out well, your paper will be selected for the next LACNIC event. So don't forget about this. And we look forward to receiving your proposals. May I ask a question? Yes, of course, go ahead. Until what is the deadline? Until February the 8th. Okay, great. We still have some time. Well, in fact, if you wish to see something else with Container Labs, maybe you could work on that too. And one of the things I have prepared, which is not only about right, routing, which is at the very core of Container Labs, but in addition to that, there are many other things for example, management, things that are external to the routers. I have an interesting lab on telemetry and something including all the emerging protocols. I don't know if that would be interesting for the forum, but maybe I could develop this for the next LACNIC event. Yes, we look forward to receiving your proposal. Sounds interesting, yes. As regards the graphic path, there is a command in Container Labs. It is Container Lab Graph. And the same YAML you're using, and automatically, it opens up port 580 of the host in order to access that graphic. I have it over here. And um, this is not very organized, but here you have the backbone router. And router one is over here. And router three with its client. And this is a very, very useful tool. to check whether the topology is a correct one. Any questions? I was forgetting something over here. Let's close this. Sudo CLAB destroy. 
minus T IPv6 lab YAML, and automatically this laboratory is destroyed as easy as that. So great. So great to more questions here. One question. In case they wish to contact you, I'm going to enter the my email in the chat. I'm in Discord too in Container Labs channel. And of course, because of where I come from, I speak Spanish, but there is language could sometimes be a barrier. So there is a container lab thread in Spanish, and there we can have a lot of exchange regarding container labs. Well, that's very interesting. And of course, we would collaborate in disseminating that thread in Spanish on Discord. There is a final question. There is a final question, and this would be the end. Mr. Emerson, Emerson Geddes is asking whether you have an API of Container Lab. Well, that's a good question. Yes. I'm not so familiar with that. Well, not an API as such, but for example, how to deploy container lab in an automated way. Container labs are also being used to create a digital twin of the this in production. So the idea is to make this as automated as possible. But if you wish, you can contact me through Discord or by mail. And then I can tell you more about this. Well, in that case, Alejandro, enter your email in the chat. And it's a great comment. Mr. Guedes is asking, is saying, I can help you to develop a graphic interface for Container Lab. So any participation is most welcome. So, if you wish to ask more questions, please do so. We're running out of time. A two-hour webinar might be a bit long, so we don't wish to extend this further. Okay, Alejandro, I will take up much more of your time. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, and I'm at your disposal. And here you have my email address in the chat. Sandra, would you like to make some closing remarks? And you, Alejandro, too? So thank you very much. I don't have much more to add. Just thank you very much. You have said everything. This was a great workshop. And I'm sure many of the participants have learned a lot. I'd like to thank all the participants. We have had more than 170 participants during the session. So thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you in 2024 with more topics, with more webinars. And goodbye then. Alejandro Guevara, would you like to address some closing remarks? Well, thank you very much for the welcome and for the great questions too. It's good that you paid attention, you didn't fall asleep. And Happy holidays to all of you. All the very best with your dear friends and families. Thank you very much. Goodbye.